I'm uh, a, uh, a professor at the NATO College, and uh, his uh, specialty is the issue of arms proliferation. Uh, and uh, from this year on, he uh, has been teaching at uh, uh, the Brookings Institution in Delhi and the India, well, the India Center of the Brookings Institution in New Delhi. Uh, of course, um, he's an expert on international relations, and uh, this is, uh, well, one of the fields where he's published a number of uh, papers on disarmament, arms control, non proliferation as well as, and more recently, and uh, uh, even more so uh, uh, now that he is uh, uh, based in India, the issue of emerging uh, countries and strategic balances in India, in Asia. Um, and as you well know, uh, uh, Paul Sidhu will be with us again on 3rd of March to address this issue of uh, strategic challenges in um, Asia. Now, this is our second lecture on uh, nuclear issues. The previous uh, lecture was, uh, was something of an introduction to the uh, uh, general uh, issue of deterrence. And now I will give him the floor to um, address another aspect of these issues. Uh, more to do with, uh, well, nuclear issues in the 21st century. Uh, we had not really looked at uh, the issue at the last uh, lecture, but uh, in a schizo schizophrenic way, we believe that the disarmament should go hand in hand with the deterrence uh, until such time as another uh, solution was found uh, to uh, find some sort of uh, uh, international beast. Uh, so uh, we look at the uh, other, uh, the, well, the second half of this, uh, 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 of this issue uh, with him. Now, as um, was uh, the case last time, we'll have, uh, of course, we'll listen carefully to uh, Paul Sidhu's lecture, then uh, Bruno will uh, uh, give us his views on uh, nuclear issues, but we also have Nicole Lesotho and Guillaume Schlumberger who will uh, take part in the discussion, but of course the uh, audience uh, can take part in the exchange. And again, we are so delighted to have you with us tonight. Uh, I think really the honor uh, is, is mine, and I'm very much humbled uh, to be part of this inaugural uh, series, uh, but also to be following in, uh, in, in really the illustrious footsteps of all the other speakers that you've uh, had. And I would really like to start by giving three sets of uh, thank yous uh, to, to show my uh, gratitude. First, of course, is a, a very warm thank you uh, to you, uh, Louis Gauthier, and indeed uh, the University uh, of Paris-Sorbonne for organizing uh, this really timely and important set of, uh, of, of discussions and, and lectures, but also for this uh, setting uh, right across the road uh, from the Pantheon, where you have uh, not just some of the best French thinkers, but perhaps some of the best thinkers in the world. Uh, so I'm really grateful for this setting uh, at, at this incredible uh, temple of knowledge. Um, the second is I'm really, again, grateful uh, to be invited to be part of this, uh, these proceedings uh, because it also shows uh, that you are very interested in listening to a non-European voice. Uh, and I'm grateful to that, for that, uh, to be able to present a perspective uh, which hopefully will be very different from yours, uh, but also challenge uh, hopefully some of the established uh, kind, of, kind of norms. And the third uh, really set of thank yous I'd like to give is really to all of you for not just coming, but also indulging me speaking in English. Uh, uh, which is not certainly, you know, most of your first language, and I do apologize for that rather than speaking in the more, uh, you know, beautiful and expressive French. Uh, so with that indulgence, let me, let me start by looking at uh, my, my talk today, which is titled Nuclear Disorder in the 21st Century. But let me, let me start with sort of focusing on something that all the luminaries who are now permanently residing in the Pantheon focused on, uh, 
even though they came from very different disciplines and backgrounds, philosophy, mathematics, <coughs> nuclear physics, they all pursued one objective, to try and understand the order, uh, to try and sort of break through what was a uh, de certain degree of uh, lack of knowledge, disorder, but try and understand what would be the nature of order. And I think that's where uh, this particular presentation of mine is also coming from, to try and sort of understand what is uh, the notion of nuclear order and then sort of try to look at what are the challenges of nuclear disorder and how can we sort of uh, go, go beyond that. Now, you know, when we start the quest for order uh, and, and, and looking at what the order might be, my talk talks about this in the nuclear context, but clearly order predates nuclear age and nuclear weapons. Uh, in fact, there has been a quest for order as long as there have been institutions uh, of states and quasi-states. Um, efforts to create and maintain cordial or at least non-conflictual relations between great powers in particular, uh, has always been uh, an instance, even in the pre-nuclear era. Uh, the best example that comes to my mind is that of the Concert of Europe, uh, leading on from the Congress of Vienna in 1815. Now, of course, the Concert of Europe was far from perfect. It had all kinds of flaws. But it is quite remarkable that the Concert of Europe was able to manage uh, relations between the great powers, more or less, for nearly a century. Uh, and that is actually quite a remarkable achievement, even when you look at you know, where we are today and look at where nuclear weapons have been able to manage power. and We haven't quite come up to the 70-year mark yet. Uh, so that's quite a remarkable sort of achievement and one that needs to be kept in mind because it was only at the end of, uh, you know, at the end, uh, around 1914, that the Concert of Europe really finally collapsed and was not able to maintain that, maintain that order. So uh, the point I'm trying to make here is that, you know, clearly order predates the nuclear era. And this has been an uh, objective and an approach that everybody has tried over the years, over the ages. So what makes nuclear weapons and nuclear order different. And let me start with uh, the first slide, if I can figure it out. There we are. Yes. Right. It's fine. Excellent. So William Walker, uh, one of the more thoughtful scholars on this, uh, on this subject, uh, talked about uh, nuclear order uh, in his book, Nuclear Weapons and International Order, in 2011, where he talked about nuclear order entails evolving patterns of thought and activity that serve primary goals of world survival, war avoidance, and economic development, and the quest for a tolerable accommodation of pronounced differences in the capabilities, practices, rights, and obligations of states. Now, one could actually argue that this is also the case without nuclear weapons. Uh, you know, that you would really need all of these elements even if nuclear weapons were not in the mix. So what difference have nuclear weapons made? And here, uh, I would argue that there's, it's important to have uh, three kind of assumptions that we need to keep in mind. First, until now, until the start of the nuclear age in 1945, Order was also traditionally shaped by wars, great wars, between great powers, right? So if there was a big disagreement between the major powers which could not be resolved uh, through discussion, dialogue, otherwise, you went to war. And whoever won the war, you then had the victors, justice, and you had the creation of a world order led by the victors. But the nuclear order has added one fundamental change to that, and that is in the nuclear order, there has to be an absence of major wars between major powers, simply because it would be a nuclear war. 
Uh, Bernard Brody, you know, one of the earliest gurus on this, uh, on, on this subject, wrote in 1946 in his book, The Absolute Weapon, Atomic Power and World Order. And I'll, I'll quote from there. And he says, thus far, and this is 1946, so just the start of the nuclear age, and you only had one nuclear weapon uh, power at the moment. Thus far, the chief purpose of our military establishment has been to win wars. From now on, its chief purpose must be to avert them. It can have almost no other useful purpose. So it was really important to create a no-war uh, kind of scenario, a no-war regime between the major powers in the nuclear uh, era. The second uh, assumption that I make before, before going forward is that it is really nuclear weapons and the order that is created around them that underpinned world order in the Cold War. And it's really the one which is thought to have contributed to the long peace going forward. Now, this meant that really during the Cold War, it was either the possession or the protection under the umbrella of nuclear weapons that the related uh, nuclear order was developed. And it was really the primary factor that everybody has argued for the relatively long peace in the international system after the Second World War. Uh, and which is why I then turn to the third assumption, which is that precisely because nuclear order underlined world order in the Cold War, in the post-Cold War era, the nuclear disorder and the growing, is a growing disconnect between the nuclear weapons and the world order. And this carries a risk of war, uh, not only between the existing major powers, but particularly between what I would term as the established and the emerging major powers. And that's a major uh, concern for us to keep in mind, and which is why I'm, I'm focusing on the nuclear uh, disorder dimension. So this was by way of uh, a prelude, uh, a, a kind of a preamble. Let me now uh, share with you what I intend to do uh, over the next 40-odd minutes or so and, and, and give you uh, an, an outline. I want to really kind of um, uh, have my talk in three different uh, parts and sections, and each part will have three sort of uh, different dimensions. So you can see three is kind of a favorite number here. Uh, the first is I want to explore a little bit what, was, what led to the establishment of nuclear order in the 21st century. And here I argue that there are really three key pillars. Uh, the first is the weapons themselves, but the second is institutions and norms uh, related to how those weapons uh, were to be managed or how relations were to be managed, and I'll elaborate on that a little bit more. And the third element here is also uh, the informal institutions and informal instruments which were created to sort out relations between the nuclear weapon uh, powers as well. But I also want to underline one very important element, and which is why in the nuclear order I don't just look at the weapons. In fact, I don't look at the weapons at all, assuming that all of you understand and know them quite well. But I want to look at particularly the institutions and the norms uh, in, in specific. And that is because order, even in the nuclear world, was never only managed by military means or by the, the presence of weapons alone. Diplomacy, as well as economic skill and other skills, really played a very important role in the development and the management of this order, and I want to focus on that as well. Uh, the second part of my presentation, I will focus on uh, what has been the reasons and the origins of nuclear disorder in the 21st century. Uh, and I will argue, and hopefully be provocative, uh, to say that some of the challenges which led to the nuclear order, disorder uh, came from states within the existing order, uh, 
Uh, some challenges came from states outside the existing order. And the third set of challenges actually came from non-state actors. Uh, and I'll elaborate on you know, how and why that sort of happened. The third part of my presentation, I want to try and focus on how uh, we as the international community, uh, France as a key player, as a major power, uh, would try to redress this nuclear disorder in the 21st century. And here again, I will try and explore three alternative approaches. Uh, the first being really to try and reassert and reestablish what I call the ancien regime of a nuclear order uh, through either force or diplomacy or a combination of the two. Second, to establish a new post-nuclear weapon world order. And third, really kind of muddle through, uh, you know, where you're moving from a sort of a de facto uh, uh, situation to a quasi de jure regi uh, uh, regime of a new kind of order. So, uh, let's start with what, what, was the, uh, what was the establishment of the nuclear order? What were the key elements uh, that, that led to the creation of this uh, nu nuclear order? So the first point I want to make there is that really it was about the weapons. That even though the Cold War was dominated by the dyad relationship of the United States and the Soviet Union, all major powers, established and rising, developed nuclear pe weapons. And they also developed uh, deterrence theories related to their use. Uh, so it was not that they outsourced uh, their uh, nuclear weapon capabilities to the two superpowers. They chose to have their own, in, certainly in the case of France, but others as well, independent deterrence uh, with a particular logic to that. Even though there was a, you know, a, a sort of dominant dyad relationship which controlled the nuclear order and the world order. The second uh, leg, or I call it the pillar, which is very important for the nuclear order, was that the major powers also established two sets of norms and institutions to serve the nuclear order. The first of these was designed to manage relations between the major powers with a view to prevent direct war between the two blocs or at the very least to maintain strategic stability. So the first of these uh, institutions range from bilateral summits, particularly between uh, the United States and the Soviet Union, to the various bilateral treaties. And I'm sure you're all familiar with them. I'm not going to go into details, but SALT, start the uh, anti-ballistic, uh, 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 sorry, yeah, the anti-ballistic missile treaty and the INF treaty, the Intermediate Nuclear Force Treaty. But at the same time, there were also institutions, and perhaps the best one that comes to mind is the Conference on Security and Cooperation in Europe, which then became uh, the OSCE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, was a very critical institution to bridge the East-West divide, not to make sure that peace broke out, although that may have been one objective as well, but to ensure that war did not break out. Um, and then, of course, I have also argued that both NATO and the Warsaw Pact also played a very important role in managing the relationship between the East and West because it introduced a degree of predictability of actions on both sides. So there was a certain degree of familiarity. And last but not the least, uh, I would also argue that the United Nations Security Council played a very important role in managing relations between the great powers. Now, many people have argued that, look, uh, you know, the UN Security Council really doesn't matter. It's really only about discussing values, not interests. I think that's totally wrong. Some of the most fundamental differences between, uh, uh, you know, the major superpowers have been resolved in, uh, in, in the Security Council. Let's take the uh, – I'll give you one example to sort of illustrate that point. Uh, during the period where you, you know, the UN Security Council was frozen because of the use of veto by both the superpowers, you had the single largest process uh, 
of decolonization in the world. Uh, the emergence of independent countries which were previously colonies. Now, imagine that all of this was achieved with very little involvement of the major powers. And that is the role that the UN Security Council and the UN played. Because each one of these could have become a major crisis. Some did become a crisis. Vietnam is a very good example. But to imagine, think of all the number of countries which came out of colonization, and each one of them could be a potential great power crisis. It was not. And this is where I think, uh, you know, the UN uh, and the UN Security Council also played a role. But there was a second, if you like, uh, leg of this pillar, which is also very important beyond managing relations between the major powers uh, themselves. And this was designed to preserve the existing nuclear order, which had been built around the five nuclear weapon states, and to prevent the addition of new armed nuclear armed states uh, joining or you know, breaking into uh, this, this club. And so this order really prescribed behavior both for the nuclear weapon states but also for the non-nuclear weapon states. And uh, this has broadly been called the nuclear non-proliferation regime and it really goes beyond uh, just the nuclear non-proliferation treaty. It, in my opinion, it includes the Partial Test Ban Treaty 1963, uh, the Outer Space Treaty 1967, of course, then the NPT of uh, 1968, which, by the way, then was enforced by the International Atomic Energy Agency set up way back in 1957. But this was clearly not enough uh, to manage the nuclear order even during uh, the Cold War. There was a third pillar which was established, and this was the informal pillar of unilateral, bilateral, but also plurilateral arrangements to buttress the formal arrangements to manage not only the relations of the major powers, but also to prevent further proliferation. Now, most of these were triggered by one event, the Indian nuclear test of 1974, and I'll come to that in a bit uh, later on. But this includes the nuclear suppliers group, which is set up in 1975-1976, uh, the missile technology control regime set up in 1987, uh, and the Zanger Committee, which also sort of came into existence from 1974 uh, onwards. Now, the, the, there are two, two, two points that I, I want to make here which are really important. One is, let me not uh, sort of give you the impression that this uh, nuclear order was very easy to make that, you know, the, the, you know, that Washington and Moscow got together and over some vodka and, you know, whatever the Americans drink, decided that this is what the nuclear order was going to be like, and that was it. It was really difficult. Uh, they had to use a lot of pressure, a lot of perseverance to make sure that the whole sort of structure uh, was built up. It was not at all uh, smooth uh, in, by any w ways and means. But at the same time, it was also possible because both the nuclear powers had the common, uh, nucle uh, the superpowers had the common objective uh, to ensure that they did not go to war with each other, uh, but also that the world that they, uh, you know, existed at that point of time was relatively simple. You could measure major powers, uh, the, the factors of measuring major powers was relatively simple. It was military and it was economic might. You know, it was not more as complicated as it has become uh, today. And because of that, very often you saw the United States and the Soviet Union actually coming together to create this nuclear order, even though they had their own bilateral differences. And there are two instances where this is very, very evident. Uh, one of them is in the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, and the second is in the Nuclear Suppliers Group. Now, this is not to say that all the other nuclear powers, uh, major powers, did not play a role in contributing to strengthening the norms and institutions, but really it was the United States and the Soviet Union that led this process. And this was very much a top-down process. Okay? Now, of course, if you, if you agree with what I'm saying about the three pillars, right, then it was also very important 
for the major powers and the major nuclear weapon states uh, to be members of all the three pillars. So you could then actually interact with each other, but you could also ensure uh, that the nuclear order was preserved. But of course, you know, real life doesn't work so simply and so easily. And we notice, for example, that at least two of the members of uh, this nuclear order uh, were not really members of all of the pillars all through. Uh, France, for example, is a very good instance, right? Uh, France actually stayed out of the NPT negotiations uh, and only joined the NPT in 1992. Uh, and similarly, China only joined the NPT in 1992 and even today has not joined the MTCR. But they are all members of the UN Security Council. So at least there are some parts of the pillar where they're still members of. And I think that plays an important role as well. I also now want to turn a little bit to try and describe that, you know, this um, nuclear order, it was not static. It was dynamic, right? And one element, and there was a certain degree of flexibility to accommodate some geopolitical changes, especially rising powers, in the nuclear order. And here I think the best example of accommodation uh, is that of China. Now, when China conducted its first nuclear test in 1964, it could not be considered a major power by any factor, by any parameter. It was not a major power, right? And yet, there were two accommodations which were allowed to China, which is very interesting, right? The first accommodation was uh, that China was eventually brought on to the UN Security Council in 1971. Um, and that's interesting because until then, four of the nuclear weapon states were already members of the Security Council. China was not. But by 71, it was brought on board. The second accommodation is slightly more, uh, I think, controversial, and that's why I'm even pushing it forward. Under some circum circumstances, as the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty was being negotiated, it is quite conceivable that the treaty could have been negotiated in a way that China may have been outside the treaty. It's quite conceivable. But it is quite interesting that, ch that the treaty decided to put down a particular date as when it would recognize nuclear weapon states. And again, it's, it, it's unusual, because if you look at treaties either before or after that, none of them actually put down a particular date from which they recognize a certain capability. Uh, and one could argue, and certainly the Indians have argued, that this was done to accommodate China into the NPT ambit. Now, it's a different matter. Uh, that China was not even part of the NPT negotiations uh, and only joined the NPT in 1992. So as far as it was concerned, the NPT was redundant. But it is interesting to see that there was a sense of trying to include uh, China importantly in the nuclear order as it was evolving. But in contrast, uh, and this is my next point, India which also did not have any trappings of a major power in 1974 when it conducted its first nuclear test, was not accommodated in a similar way, right? Uh, now, of course, one could argue that the NPT was, had already entered into force, so, you know, uh, the horse had already bolted the barn. There was really no objective in, in going forward in that direction. But it's also important that the nuclear suppliers group was really triggered by the Indian nuclear test to try and block, if you like, some of the other ways that countries might try to challenge uh, the formal nuclear order. And this remains, uh, you, you know, one of the biggest challenges to the nuclear order quite early on by a country which very much wanted to join that nuclear order from the outside. But let me talk about another uh, very successful, I think in my, in my uh, sort of estimation, perhaps the only successful uh, order, uh, way that the nuclear order prevented another country from joining it and in fact uh, disarmed it. And this was South Africa. 
1977, the UN Security Council unanimously passed Resolution 418. And this, by the way, is the very first uh, resolution which is passed under Chapter 7 of the UN uh, Charter, which allows for use of force, uh, that invoked uh, you know, disarmament of uh, South Africa's nuclear arsenal. Uh, and this was done even though South Africa, like India, was not a member of the NPT. Uh, and of course, South Africa was disarmed. It took a very long time, almost 15 years uh, more uh, uh, plus. But this was perhaps the biggest in example of how the nuclear order was secured from one of the other challengers uh, who sort of came through. So if this is what the nuclear order looked like, and this is how it sort of functioned through the Cold War and through the 20th century, what was happening, what happened at the end of uh, the 20th century, what were the bases for the origins of uh, the nuclear disorder? And again, you know, as I've argued, uh, that the origins of this nuclear disorder can be seen in three different strands. First, from within uh, the order itself, second from outside the order, and third from a set of new actors, non-state actors, who threatened uh, the, the nuclear order as well. So now within the nuclear order, there were actually two very divergent strands which became apparent at the end of the Cold War. One was actually to consolidate uh, the nuclear order. Uh, and here, you know, you see a series of uh, developments which, I, again, I just want to flag as we, as we move on. Uh, the UN Special Commission on, uh, and the IAEA were involved in Iraq uh, to dismantle Iraq's nuclear program in 91 uh, onwards, 1992. Uh, second, uh, China and France finally joined the NPT in 1992, certainly strengthened the nuclear order. Third, uh, North Korea, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, which had actually walked out of uh, the NPT in 1993, uh, uh, actually came, uh, you know, there was a framework agreement with it in 1994 to try and bring it back into the fold. Uh, next, there was an indefinite extension of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty in 1995, really kind of anchoring uh, the order in the NPT, uh, f soon thereafter, India's uh, nuclear, potential nuclear test preparations were also identified, and that was stopped and prevented in 95-96. And uh, finally, there was also a move to create the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty and the Fissile Material uh, Cut-Off Treaty. So at the end of uh, the Cold War, uh, you know, at, and at maybe the last decade of the 20th century, there was really a rare opportunity to decouple world order from nuclear weapons. And there were some steps, very, you know, tangential, very hesitant steps which were taken. Again, at the unilateral level, many people may forget, in September 1991, President uh, George Herbert Walker Bush made a speech where he basically unilaterally reduced uh, the size of the American arsenal, uh, took bombers uh, which were carrying uh, missiles off the alert and removed uh, all the uh, uh, war, uh, nuclear warheads from ships and attacked submarines. Uh, the UN Security Council, for the first time in its history, passed a presidential statement on the 31st of December 1992, where it basically said, proliferation of all weapons of mass destruction constitute a threat to international peace and security. And it went further to specify nuclear weapons and noted the decision of many countries to adhere to the NPT and emphasize the integral role in the implementation of the NPT. So here was really an opportunity to try and break out of this old order and maybe try and create a new world order which need not necessarily have been dependent on nuclear weapons, right? However, that opportunity was lost. Um, because at the same time, as you saw some of you, what you might consider or one might consider positive steps 
towards uh, strengthening the nuclear order, there were also other steps taken which weakened it. Uh, and I'll run through a series of them. Uh, first of all, there was the unilateral actions taken by both the United States and the United Kingdom to actually enforce UNSCOM's operations in 1991. And that really broke the consensus of the UN Security Council, which until then was very unusual. This is the first time that all the major powers were actually cooperating on nuclear issues. Second, uh, the framework with the DPRK also started to unravel. And soon thereafter, you know, uh, DPRK became a, a major problem. Third, there were a series of key promises that had been made uh, under the indefinite exp extension of the uh, NPT in 1995. Central to this was the promise of a Middle East zone free of weapons of mass destruction. The fact that there was no forward movement on that was seen as a big betrayal, particularly by uh, non-nuclear member states of the NPT from the Middle East in particular. Uh, and then last uh, but not the least, both the United States and China, uh, having pushed through the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, did not join it. Uh, and that created, uh, that, that created a challenge as well. Um, at the same time, there was also uh, not just inertia and concern of the uncertain world that led to all the nuclear weapon states retaining uh, their nuclear weapons, but there was also moves to modernize them. Um, at the same time, in doctrinal terms, the role of nuclear weapons, which until now had been limited and confined to being operated against other nuclear weapons only, started to expand. It now included responses to other weapons of mass destruction, and in some cases, also uh, large conventional or even asymmetrical attacks. And what this did was really start to lower the threshold of nuclear, uh, of, of, of nuclear weapons uh, use. And at the same time, there was also emphasis on things like defense, particularly missile defense, and this was seen to weaken the classic deterrence relationship and strategic stability. And so that also posed a major challenge to the order from within. But I, I need to add that there was also a major challenge to the nuclear order from outside, and this was perhaps even more uh, damaging, if you like, to the nuclear uh, order uh, in, uh, at the dawn of the 20th, uh, 21st century. First of them, of course, was India's nuclear tests of May 1998, which were uh, particularly significant because they happened at a time when India was now a growing economic power, but also a potential rising power. Uh, I think it's going to remain a potential rising power for a long time, but, you know, there, it, it's gone on that trajectory. But equally more important, India was the only country which justified its nuclear tests not only on the grounds of uh, security uh, concerns, particularly vis-a-vis -vis China and Pakistan, but also on the grounds that this was a symbol of its major power status. And India has really been the only country which has very clearly articulated that it wants to join the nuclear order. So the second uh, sort of other set of challenges that actually came uh, were also from Pakistan in May 1998, but also from DPRK, which conducted three nuclear tests in October 2006, May 2009, and February 2012. Now, all of these were couched in only security terms. So Pakistan said it identified India as the primary security concern, and that's why it was conducting nuclear tests. That's why it's, it had nuclear weapons. Uh, the DPRK pointed to the presence of the U.S. nuclear weapons on the peninsula as its driver, right? Neither one of these countries sought to present themselves as major powers or seek to join the nuclear order. They had no such objective, right? Now... Pakistan has sought some parity with India in terms of membership of the various export control regimes, but it has really not sought membership of permanent membership of the UN Security Council, for example, because it has no desire to shape the world order. In contrast, India 
was very keen on becoming a part of that global governance structure, and which is why it's been pushing for permanent membership of the UN Security Council, but also wants to become a member of some of these other pillars, the missile technology control regime, the nuclear suppliers group, the informal pillar, because it sees that being an important member of the nuclear order as, as, as well. Now, um, finally, Israel uh, is, a, is a, a unique sort of example, and that's why I've said, because it doesn't have a declared nuclear weapon status, but it is sui generis. But it could be argued that even Israel does not seek to join the nuclear order. It has not really sought membership of, you know, the UN Security Council uh, or, uh, you know, want to sort of manage relations with, with the other major powers. It really sees this as an existential sort of deterrence and it wants to remain and, and, and keep it there. Now, you will note the, uh, two things. Number one, that most of these challenges come from Asia. And that's why uh, my next uh, lecture and presentation is actually going to focus on Asia and sort of say how that poses a very particular challenge, not just to the nuclear order, but also to Asia I I itself. Second, you will also note that I have made no reference to Iran uh, until now. And, 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 that's, and that's partly deliberate. Well, partly until now, Iran is not a nuclear weapon state. Uh, you know, even by their own uh, admission, by, by everybody else's uh, assessment as well. But, but there is an important point vis-a-vis uh, -vis Iran. Iran considers itself a major power and certainly has the potential uh, uh, to be one. You know, it may not be realized right away, it may never realize it, but it has a potential, right? But the question that comes to not just Iran, but I guess to all of us here as, as well, should Iran develop nuclear weapons to assert its great power status if and when it becomes a great power? Or are there other ways of uh, determining them? Now, this is also a dilemma that comes to other countries like Brazil, for example, you know, one that I haven't sort of talked about uh, that much. But let me turn from there uh, to the third set of challenges uh, which are coming to the nuclear order and which are contributing to the nuclear disorder. And these are the challenges coming from uh, non-state actors, which we immediately think of terrorist groups, but they're beyond terrorist groups as well, right? Now, this is not to say that non-state actors did not play a role before in the 20th century, but in the 21st century, the role was much more significant, much more dramatic. Uh, and it, again, there were the, 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 the challenge they posed were of two kinds. The first were terrorist acts, right, that groups would carry out. Uh, the best example of this, of course, was, you know, this came in the wake of 9-11, where you had the anthrax attacks in the U.S., but there were also other reported instances of terrorist groups seeking to build and use nuclear weapons, and this was seen to pose a major challenge to the nuclear order, and particularly also to, uh, you know, just not, not just the nuclear weapon states, but others, uh, others as well. But I want to make another argument here as well, that even without nuclear weapons, terrorist actions can lead to not just a nuclear crisis, but a potential nuclear war. And let me give you one example uh, from South Asia. Uh, many of you may remember uh, the Mumbai attacks, uh, in, you know, the Indians call it 2611, this was in 2008, where a group of uh, terrorists operating out of Pakistan came in and, you know, laid siege on Mumbai for three days. And this brought the two countries to the brink of war. Uh, now, both of them being nuclear weapon states, you can see that there is a potential where terrorist acts can lead to a crisis between nuclear armed states. And by the way, we're only thinking about India-Pakistan at the moment, but if tomorrow you see a certain trajectory in Iran, you could see a similar relationship between Israel and Iran as well, uh, where terrorist groups may uh, pose some sort of a challenge in trying to address, uh, and, and how do you address that becomes an, becomes an issue uh, there, there as well. The second set of challenges is the, uh, is the exposure of the AQ Khan network, which really underlines the challenge of these proliferation networks, particularly in weak states, which bypass the established formal and informal institutions 
and threaten the nuclear order by offering technology and know-how to not just states, but also other non-state actors, right? And here in particular, I just need to perhaps highlight that Pakistan uh, maybe folk, you know, you know, presents a very particular sort of challenge and three sets of challenges. One, as a weak state, it's not quite clear to what degree you have control over its own nuclear weapons, right? Um, second, that also, it also highlights the possibilities of states seeking nuclear weapons now have access to another unauthorized network of technology, uh, etc. And third, there is also a serious possibility of armed transnational uh, non-state actors seeking nuclear weapons, for example, al-Qaeda, being able to use some of the technology but also the expertise among uh, uh, sort of experts and technologists in and from Pakistan who may have leanings towards al-Qaeda as well. And that poses a very particular sort of uh, challenge. So let me then sort of turn to, you know, why should this uh, concern, concern us today? You know, basically, this poses a trilemma uh, for us in terms of, you know, uh, the nuclear order, and, uh, you know, which had been a key determinant all the way through the Cold War. Uh, first of all, uh, the, the first kind of part of the trilemma is, can states within the existing order actually adhere to this order in this period of transition of world order? Can nuclear stability be achieved in an era where there are advances in non-nuclear technology like cyber and space? And many have argued that this is actually undercutting uh, the nuclear deterrence uh, concept. Second, should all states with nuclear weapons outside the nuclear order be accommodated into it? You know, basically say, look, this is the way to uh, ensure the nuclear order continues, so you just bring everybody in. Or should only states with nuclear weapons, which are also emerging major powers, be accommodated? And if you decide that that is indeed the case, how does the accommodation take place? Right? And the other question is, what do you do about non-nuclearizing powers? What do you do about Brazil? Is there a way of accommodating uh, these, these countries without that? And then the third trilemma is, there is clearly a threat which is posed by non-state actors, as I've, as I've described. Can this be effectively addressed only by the five members of the present nuclear order? Or is it, in fact, important to reform the order to enable new states to contribute to dealing with the threat from non-state actors? Now, you can see a kind of a step which has been taken to uh, the nuclear security summit process, which began in 2012 with the summit that President Obama held in Washington and has continued, which tried to really expand and bring in other members who were uh, other countries which are not members of the nuclear order to try and uh, deal more effectively with non-state actors. Okay? So those are the three sort of, uh, you know, questions I think that come to my mind when we're looking at how do we want to sort of address uh, the nuclear disorder. So let me turn to the third and last part of my presentation, which is, so if you all agree that you've got these three sets of challenges to the nuclear order, which has led to the present nuclear disorder, what do you do about it? Again, I would argue uh, that there are three possible approaches, right? So one of them is that you try and reassert and reestablish the old order, the way it existed, right? The second is to go beyond that and basically say, look, we had a good run, uh, nuclear weapons worked for a time, but now, you know, everybody's getting them, they're losing value. Let's just think of a new world order where nuclear weapons play no role whatsoever, okay? And the third is you sort of say, oh, no, no, we want to keep the nuclear weapons, but we don't want to create an order without nuclear weapons. So you sort of muddle through. Uh, and you have a kind of a de facto uh, arrangement which then slowly becomes a de jure regime. So I'm going to go through all three to see, at least from my point of view, what are the prospects for all three. And, you know, I, I'm sure we'll have, a, we'll have an interesting discussion on that. I would argue that the return to the status quo of the original nuclear weapons uh, order may well be the preference of the original members, but 
to try and enforce this either to, through force or diplomacy today is nearly impossible. Okay? First of all, uh, let's, take, let's take the diplomatic approach. Until now, as I mentioned, there has been only one case, one case, in which a country was successfully disarmed diplomatically, and that was South Africa. And this was only possible because of two factors. Number one, there was absolute unity between the P5, that this is what they wanted to do. But second, and this is very important, that the approach to South Africa was not aimed at the nuclear weapons. It was aimed at regime change. And this is not just changing the government. It's changing the way uh, South Africa was set up as a country, as a regime, as the governance structure, right? And today, both of those are missing. Number one, there is no P5 unity on many of these issues on, uh, to address the diplomacy part of it. But second, regime change has become a four-letter word, uh, especially in the wake of both Iraq and Libya, uh, and it really has been sort of discredited, right? Now, the second element, the second possible approach may be, all right, look, you forget diplomacy. Let's just go in and disarm these countries by force. And let's not even wait for a consensus among the P5. Let's just do it unilaterally. Or let's get a coalition of the willing and let's go in and do it uh, unilaterally, or, you know, uh, with a coalition of the willing. Even that has problems. Uh, we have seen that, first of all, you know, I don't think we're going to get a P5 consensus. But even if you did, and implementing that process is going to be very complex, very long drawn out, with very uncertain results. And the Iraq case is a very good one, right? So on the one hand, you did manage to disarm. But on the other hand, it led to a lot of other repercussions, which, you know, we're all sort of live, having to live with today. So that poses a major challenge of trying to preserve uh, the traditional order. What about trying to establish an entirely new order, uh, not based on the possession or the protection of nuclear weapons, but really in a world not based, not uh, without nuclear weapons? Now, while this is really, you know, the dream for all the nuclear disarmers, there is a problem. And the problem is that all of the nuclear disarmers really do focus on a world without nuclear weapons, but they don't necessarily focus on security without nuclear weapons. Particularly, how do you prevent major power conflict without nuclear weapons? That's a kind of a dilemma uh, that, you know, that, that they're confronted with. Now, to move towards such an order, you would really need to have a consensus built with those who see nuclear order as absolutely integral to world order and those who can visualize an alternative order without nuclear weapons. Hmm? But even in such an order, you would need to... Uh, do something about the other two pillars of the nuclear order, particularly the UN Security Council. Uh, without a reformed or strengthened UN Security Council to prevent major power conflict among the existing and rising powers, it's not clear how you're going to have a world without nuclear weapons where you do not also have major uh, power conflict. Now, this, again, requires a greater degree of cooperation among all the major powers existing and rising than is really evident at the moment. Okay? So, where does this leave us? Uh, this leaves us, unfortunately, I think, with the third option, uh, which is muddling through. Uh, given the lack of con consensus of redressing the nuclear order through the first approaches, it is more likely that the approach which will really come to be is muddling through a series of ad hoc and informal arrangements. Okay? And here, I'll, I'll, I'll draw your attention to two sets of them. And, but let me give you examples of this. I think uh, this approach is probably most obvious in initiatives like the India-US nuclear deal, which, by the way, opened the way for India now to have similar agreements with a whole variety of countries from Canada 
to France, to Kazakhstan, uh, to Australia, uh, to South Korea, uh, practically everyone, and Japan. Uh, but also the P5 plus one agreement with Iran and the six-party talks uh, with uh, North Korea. Okay? Now, perhaps the best example here uh, relates to India, uh, where India, you know, I think there seems to be an effort to try and accommodate India into the nuclear order through the initiative like the Indo-US deal, but also trying to get it on board in, as member in the various um, export control regimes uh, which form the informal pillar. Now, here, clearly, at least from the Indian point of view, permanent membership of the UN Security Council would mark the ultimate accommodation of India in the new uh, nuclear world order. However, again, this is unlikely in the foreseeable future, right? But if this is what you want to do about a potentially rising power like India, right, what do you do about weak nuclear armed states? While there is some consensus on India, there seems to be some consensus, at least among the traditional members of the nuclear order, there is no consensus uh, relating to the other non-major uh, nuclear armed states, Pakistan, North Korea, and Israel. Nobody is making a case for Pakistan or North Korea to become a member of the nuclear order. And understandably so, because they are problematic. Uh, both of them pose the biggest proliferation challenges to the existing order and are also potentially failed states. Uh, but then the question is, what do you do? Uh, you know, given that the nuclear order is going to be as robust as its weakest link, including Pakistan and North Korea is not really an option, right? It would really render uh, the order very, very vulnerable. But then their growing nuclear arsenal also makes it impossible to disarm them through force. Nobody is talking about attacking these countries and getting rid of their nuclear weapons by force. So what exactly do you do? Uh, that does pose a very, very critical uh, sort of challenge. So let me then try and conclude by sort of saying, where does this sort of leave us? And I'm afraid it may not be a very satisfactory conclusion, but it's one that I think is, uh, is important uh, to, to put out there as well. Um, what seems clear is in the 21st century, efforts particularly on the part of the P5 to preserve the existing nuclear and world order are starting to have diminishing returns, right? Uh, now, this might relate to, on the one hand, saying that there's a continued relevance of nuclear weapons uh, in the underpinning global order, which then means that other states say, hey, we want the same security as well. And so they are getting on board uh, that dimension, is, uh, you know, on, on, on that bandwagon too. The second element is the diminished legitimacy of the unreformed UN Security Council uh, in pursuing nonproliferation, Right? Uh, the third element really is, again, the diminishing returns of imposing sanctions to change regime behavior. In some cases, we have seen that countries have actually developed their own indigenous capability, and so increasingly sanctions are not going to have as much of an impact as they probably did in the past. And last but not the least, there's also the unattractiveness of the use of force to, re uh, to reverse proliferation. I think in some ways you might argue that perhaps Iraq was the first and only instance of that. Uh, and given the Iraqi experience, there really isn't very much of an enthusiasm to try and, uh, try and change that uh, very much. So uh, really then, as an effort to prevent proliferation uh, as that fails and new states acquire nuclear weapons, there really are two broad options before the international community in general but uh, the nuclear order in particular. One, to accommodate the new states with nuclear weapons into the existing order. And clearly you can't accommodate everyone, but again, how you accommodate them is going to be a challenge. But second, to disarm states' uh, nuclear weapons and capabilities, particularly those which are not major powers, through force or some other mean. How do you do that, right? Uh, again, to exercise any one of these options, you need a consensus at least among the P5, uh, permanent members of the Security Council. However, as present cases have shown, particularly Iran, uh, 
uh, but also North Korea, you might argue, such can consensus, particularly to use force, is almost impossible to build, let alone to sustain over uh, a, a long period of time. So essentially, my own sort of argument would be that what you're probably going to see is the evolution of an, a de facto regime, which becomes a de jure regime, uh, to try and accommodate some of the major powers with and without nuclear weapons into a new sort of arrangement. This may well go beyond the P5. Uh, perhaps the G20 may be one such arrangement which is possible to try and explore. But again, the problem with the G20 is that it's too diverse, too mixed, um, too many differences. So you may really need to think of a subgroup between the, uh, within the G20 to try and address that. But how will that group come together? Where will it form? Who will take the lead in that? And where will it sort of function remains to be very much uh, of, of a challenge. So let me end uh, with a quote uh, or, or to paraphrase another luminary who lies uh, across the street from us, uh, Victor Hugo. Uh, and and he's, he, of course, reminded us all that one cannot resist uh, the idea whose time has come. Uh, and clearly, the time for a new nuclear order has arrived. Thank you. Thank you. Merci pour cette... Thank you so much uh, for this uh, clear and um, thought-provoking um, presentation. And, and uh, it is always good when uh, focusing on, on uh, new uh, aspects of, uh, of an issue that uh, there are entirely um, new ways of, um, of contemplating um, some of the big issues of the day. Now, we have this sort of um, architecture with the five big players of the nuclear age and the, the NPT and, and uh, the Security Council. But um, over and beyond that, you know about the uh, talks about Iran, uh, Turkey, Brazil joining the, the Security Council. Uh, or uh, with uh, some leverage on the rest of the world. And uh, uh, is it not the case that um, these countries um, could uh, bring grist to your mill about item two or three? Either we come up with a new position altogether or uh, you bring in new players. I mean, that's the first um, idea that came to mind. But first, maybe Bruno would like to say something, I believe. Yes, well... I, 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 I will be brief because I had uh, no intention of, of speaking tonight, but still I'm delighted that uh, uh, this chair should have invited Paul Sidhu because Paul is a citizen of the world and only a citizen of the world could give us a, a comprehensive view, a global view of the nuclear uh, uh, situation. It is through Paul that I uh, understood globalization to begin with. Uh, back in 1999, the two of us were sitting together in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Uh, I was having a margarita, and Paul well, was saying, well, I didn't realize that uh, Grand National, the Orchestre National de Barbès had come out with a new album. And here you have uh, this uh, uh, Sikh Indian talking about uh, globalization, drinking a margarita and referring to Le Grand Orchestre de Barbès, Orchestre National de Barbès. So this goes to show that uh, 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 Paul, when speaking about the world, has a special lenses that enable him to address uh, the world from uh, many different viewpoints. I would like to uh, make a quick statement to, that will lead me to four questions. As far as I can see, the reason there's a nuclear order is that we have, a, well, a state of affairs, but also three paradigms, paradigms in, in the plan, uh, platonician sense of the platonic. The, you, you have a, uh, between the P5 and the N5, that is the, uh, the, nuclear, the official powers of the non-proliferant treaties are those that have a right of veto on the Security Council. Now, Paul knows it full well, but this coincidence has not always been the case. Beijing 
uh, as we said, uh, only joined the Security Council as a permanent member only seven years after it became a nuclear power. Now, um, the, uh, the, the paradigms of a, a conceptual, uh, legal, and, and political, in terms of concept, uh, uh, nuclear we is deterrent. Nuclear, the nuclear weapon should only be uh, deterrent. The legal framework is the non-proliferation treaty, the uh, IAEA. Uh, the idea is to try and stop proliferation uh, and, and 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 codify this in legal, couch it in legal terms. And then the the third aspect, and you you uh, have not mentioned it as much. Uh, of course, uh, arms control goes without saying that uh, those weapons that do have weapons should talk should understand one another, should trust one another, and uh, there should be some element of predictability in the system for such an order to be stable. Now, having stated all that, this brings me to four questions. To what extent? To what extent is this order stable, and is there any risk of entropy in the system? Have, I mean, uh, hearing what you had to say, I, I believe there is such a risk of entropy, not necessarily affecting the four items I mentioned. I believe there's uh, one stable item and that's pillar number two, the idea that uh, a nuclear weapon uh, should only be one for uh, deterrence and nothing else. And I think, and by the way, I s allow me to disagree a little bit on that. I don't mean to dwell on that because uh, 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 it, it is not as relevant uh, compared to the other uh, issues we're discussing here. But I, I, I do not believe that uh, there's been a lowering of the nuclear uh, threshold after the Cold War, but that, that's uh, a side issue uh, we don't mean to get into. But back to what I was saying, to what extent uh, is uh, the system entropic? Has there been uh, entropy? Then to what extent are the uh, four pillars or systems dependent on another? I believe there is uh, uh, dependence. It's not as though one was independent of the others. You took the, the example of India which was a, a sort of a, well maybe it's a sweet, generous, uh, but uh, still the more you give the impression that in order to sit as a permanent member on the Security Council, uh, you need to be a nuclear state, even though this is not officially said, but de facto in the way it's perceived, that is the case. Uh, well, if such is the case, you can't encourage non-proliferation because on the one hand, you have every incentive to be nuclear because the, 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 the carrot is the, is the nuclear is a seat on the, on, on, on the Security Council. So you have order and disorder being promoted s simultaneously. And then those who promote disarmament and those are more reserved uh, may have a, a, an issue here because you want to, if you want to break the de facto connection between P5 and N5, as it were, I think uh, you, regardless of your agenda, you certainly should, it's easy to agree that P5 and N5 shouldn't be connected. I mean, you could reform this. I mean, you yourself are well familiar with this because you work with the UN. You know that how difficult it is to bring about a reform in the UN system to change the, 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 the deal. But of course, should one of the five permanent members give up on uh, nuclear weapons, they would still remain a member of, uh, a permanent member of the UN Security Council. If Britain, uh, and regardless of what Tony Blair uh, wrote in his memoirs, but Tony Blair wrote that uh, in his memoirs that uh, he took whatever steps were necessary to renew the Trident nuclear submarine because he said I didn't want uh, Britain to lose its uh, permanent seat on the Security Council. Now, reading this, you, you, you drop the book from your hands, and I don't believe he actually believed what he said, but still, uh, uh, th this is hardly hardly satisfying to see this sort of explicit thing between being a nuclear power and a permanent member of the Security Council, at least enshrine this. And then another issue which you did not really mention, you talked about uh, a nuclear-free world, but uh, is nuclear disarmament as a process, is that a process that would consolidate order or would that be a factor of entropy and disorder? You refer to a nuclear-free world, but you did not give us your view as to just what that process, the, the disarmament process might be. Is this uh, uh, on the part of official nuclear powers uh, sitting on the uh, non NPT in the de facto powers. I mean, uh, uh, where does entropy come in and when does uh, the disorder uh, take its place? And then Iran, you mentioned Iran, and, and, and there's a challenge right there because, well, the Iranian system has a contradiction of its own, doesn't it? Because on the one hand, there it wants to be part of the nuclear order and at the same time it wants to destroy the nuclear order. They want to be part of the nuclear order in as much as Iran at least uh, 
on the face of it, wants to display itself as an abiding member of the non-proliferant treaty. And at the same time, there you have a country whose present regime uh, is uh, very uh, uh, claims its uh, rights vis-a-vis uh, -vis regional order or an international order uh, has shown to be very, very uh, 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 vindictive. Now, uh, I don't know if all will agree with me, but I believe that uh, if there's an example to follow, it should be rather India than North Korea, surely. But um, uh, if you were in Iran's shoes, I mean, the, the, the striking thing is that back in 1998, there they get sanctions from America, and seven years down the road, uh, well, they, 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 they have a cooperation agreement, which at least seen from the outside, um, shows that, um, at least on, on paper, uh, you, you, you have reconciliation between um, a, a nuclear uh, country and America. In any case, that, that, the issue of, uh, 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 of Iran is, is central uh, about entropy, but of course, should Iran become a nuclear state, well, then the very concept of nuclear order uh, would be probably shattered. It would be difficult to come up with another one. All right. Well, look, that, that was a lot of questions. <laughs> well, he could probably go on for, for ages. But in uh, any case, the issue of entropy in the system, is there an incontrovertible incontrover equation between being a member of the a permanent member of the Security Council and being a nuclear state? Uh, the virtuous uh, uh, cycle in terms of uh, a nuclear disarmament and what could be the role of emerging countries in that process of disarmament. And then um, the talks about uh, Iran. So that's basically the four questions. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, Thank you very much, uh, and, and Bruno, always a pleasure, whether it's in Santa Fe or in Paris, uh, to, to discuss these issues with you. I'm, I guess we're missing the margarita. Uh, but uh, you, can have, you can have one afterwards if, you, if you're good. On a couple of the questions uh, that you talked about, and the point I was, I was trying to make is that, you know, you have – let me start with India, because you mentioned that in sort of passing. Uh, India is a really odd country because it sort of falls a little bit between the old order and the new one, uh, in the sense that, you know, if you look at, uh, you look at the instance of China, right, uh, it, it's sort of 10 years behind. Uh, if in some ways uh, there had been a possibility of accommodating India the way that, I, and I would still sort of argue, China was accommodated in the sense of uh, it was not a foregone conclusion that, uh, you know, China would have become a permanent Security Council member in 1971. Uh, and I'm not saying this is a grand conspiracy at the same time, but I think there was a sense that, uh, and, and you know, of course, when the Chinese nuclear test was, con, uh, you know, conducted and that process was going on, the Kennedy administration very seriously thought of attacking China to disarm it. I mean, there was that talk and discussion. But at some point, uh, you know, there was a sense of, look, these guys are serious. Uh, it's better to have them inside uh, the pillars, the three pillars. Uh, it's a different matter. China chose not to be inside the three pillars, uh, or all of them, but some of them, you know, it picked and chose. But there was that kind of effort. Um, you did not see that in the case uh, of India. And I think there were, there were good reasons for that uh, as well, right? But I think in some ways that was a sort of missed opportunity because you could almost sort of see that if there had been that degree of accommodation, uh, and I'm not saying it would have been easy, it would have posed all kinds of problems, particularly when you had the NPT already entered into force. Uh, but, you know, there was, and perhaps... I've always been curious about the timing of the Indian nuclear test of 1974. And perhaps there was one perception that maybe something could have happened in the first PREPCOM, uh, the REVCON, in 1975. I don't know. Maybe it was a misconceived notion, uh, all of that. And we know the NPT itself has evolved a lot, right? So in some ways, 
India poses an old world problem which is sort of carried on into the new world. That's the kind of part of the, part of the sort of dilemma, right? Uh, but then you have a new world sort of issue where interestingly most of the countries uh, which are, have acquired nuclear weapons are not major powers, have no aspiration of being major powers, right? And, and the question then was, you know, how could you address them? And that, that question still remains. Um, so, so there's two sort of sets of questions. One is, how do you, you know, even today, what is the perceived role vis-a-vis -vis India in the nuclear order? Should it remain outside that order, uh, which creates its own problems? Uh, but if you want to accommodate it, you know, can, you, can we only do that informally? without going the formal way, and that's quite possible because I agree with you, the reforms, particularly of the Security Council, are not going to happen, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, this is a, obviously this is a halfway house. It's not a formal uh, induction into, if you like, you know, the nuclear order. But then what does that do for the others who are also challenging the nuclear order but are not major powers? What do you do with them? Uh, you know, how, how exactly do you, do you address them? Because, I mean, I don't think anybody's making a case for them joining the nuclear order. I mean, not even all of them are making the case that they want to join the nuclear order. Uh, you know, so that, that poses uh, something, of a, something of a challenge. So clearly in that sense, you know, the existing nuclear order as it exists is not able to, uh, is, is not able to deal with that. Uh, and that's why I sort of said muddling through seems to be the option, you know, where you're trying to create a sort of a de facto or, or make de jure what exists already. And, you know, there's a little bit of, of that process. But I do want to take you on, uh, and, and this is actually the point that I think we're both in, in sync. Does nuclear disarmament uh, provide one option? Yes and no. Uh, I agree with you that you know, nuclear disarmament for the sake of nuclear disarmament is actually really quite dangerous because, uh, you know, it's, and this is not to say that, you know, uh, nuclear weapons need to be there right till the end of time, but they have served a purpose of managing great power relations. And the question is, what is the alternative to that? Uh, now, this is why I, I began by talking about the concept of Europe. There is an alternative to that, but you need to then strengthen the other two pillars of, of uh, interaction between the nuclear, uh, between the major powers. Uh, and that, uh, you know, as, as you've said, and we, we kind of agree, poses a huge challenge. Uh, because today, if you said, okay, look, Let's, let's do away with the United Nations and start again. I don't think we'll have anything similar at all. Uh, it's not possible. That's too much of a risk. Uh, so, you know, how do, how do you sort of get there? Uh, you, you know, that's the, that, that's the kind of challenge that you have. So I think disarmament, if they can also look at the security dimension, particularly of relations, between major powers with the objective of preventing major power conflict is going to be a key component to that. And again, I don't see that starting to happen in any of the initiatives that we've talked about. None. Uh, you, you know, there that, 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 that simply is no such sort of sense. So in, in that sort of sense, you're stuck with the dilemma of the world order is changing, right? The components of world order until now were nuclear weapons. One component, shall I say. You know, let me, let me qualify that. So if we're going to move to a world without nuclear weapons, then what are the components? Uh, the problem is, and this is where I come back to that really missed opportunity of the lost decade. Uh, see, there's good news and bad news about nuclear weapons and major power relations. Uh, the good news is there was no war right? Uh, I mean, between the major powers. The bad news is when the Cold War ended, there was no agreement on who won and who lost. And there was no sitting down together and developing a new world order. Uh, 
which really is what happened at the end of World War II. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, there was, uh, that you should immediately disband the UN. That probably would not have happened. But there may have been a reconsideration of how it was structured, and there may have been some changes. And by the way, some changes were made. Um, the most obvious one, which everybody takes for granted, is that at the end of the Cold War, uh, there were 15 contenders to the permanent seat on the Security Council. The fact that it went to the Russian Federation uh, is not necessarily a foregone conclusion. Uh, and, and the fact that it went to the Russian Federation is an interesting question, right? So, uh, I mean, what I'm trying to say is, you know, there was an opportunity that you could have, one could have thought of, of uh, working with the system that you had to try and develop a way of accommodating some of the emerging powers. But then there's another dilemma. At, the, at that decade, none of these countries were rising powers. I mean, even today, even South Africa, you wouldn't consider rising powers in another 20, 25 years. Uh, Brazil, perhaps a little bit more. So there's that dilemma as well. So, you know, my sense is, and I agree with you, I don't think there's going to be very much of a reform of the Security Council. But what you're probably going to have is a more ad hoc arrangement outside of the Council, where increasingly you're engaging with some of these more emerging powers. Uh, with nuclear weapons, but also without nuclear weapons. But how long that will necessarily sustain uh, or is viable over a period of time is not clear. I mean, at some point, that may have to become de jure. Uh, how that becomes de jure, uh, you know, I don't have the answer to, unfortunately. That's, uh, that, 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 remains, uh, that, that remains the problem. Uh, on, on Iran, uh, I mean, I, I totally agree with you. You know, it, it, had, the, it had one option to follow, uh, approach to follow. It followed a, a very different kind of approach vis-a-vis -vis the DPRK kind of approach, uh, which uh, it has itself to blame uh, and has landed in all kinds of challenges and issues uh, there, there, there as well. Besides, uh, again... Um, you know, Iran probably needs to prove that it is very much on the path of being a rising economy, uh, economic power, and then a potential rising power. Because until then, you know, it, it's really not playing that same, in the same league, in the same game, and that, that poses a challenge uh, as, as well. I think I've probably answered some of them, but if I haven't, Vous aurez l'occasion d'y revenir. Je passe la parole. You will. You can certainly. You took uh, most, if not all, of the questions. But I believe there may be questions from the audience. Ah, Nicole. I, I am with Bruno Tertre. I hadn't planned on saying anything, but I would like to tell Paul is that I was uh, most excited uh, by his uh, lecture the three chapters, the three sub-chapters, the three uh, arguments and three counter-arguments. This is ideal in such a house as the Sorbonne. And I'm, I'm absolutely delighted that he should be with us here uh, uh, tonight. Now, uh, I met Palm when I was running an agency in the EU on the security issues, and Palm was the most European of all uh, globalized players. Um, and Rather than a question, maybe a, a, a comment, but uh, 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 food for thought. I am under the impression that right now we do have a, a shrinking nuclear disorder, but a, a growing uh, global disorder. And, and, and there's a disconnect between the two, but it's not the disconnect you, uh, uh, you refer, uh, well, which you uh, which you deplore the fact that it wasn't used, the, the lost opportunity in the 1990s. Um, we have a situation, I mean, this microphone is, uh, is odd. It's, it works on and off. In any case, you have this uh, order. We will probably have to give you another microphone because this one isn't. There we go. Thank you. So you have fewer and fewer proliferating states than you had in the 1980s. Uh, nuclear terrorism, uh, we talk about it. We don't see it much, whereas the Khan uh, sect was visible in the 80s. Iran was supposed to see the big post-Iraqi uh, power, but talks are underway. So 
nuclear disorder is dwindling away, even though there may be some uh, sore points, such as uh, North Korea, Iran, and Pakistan. Pakistan, not so much as a nuclear power, but as a as a, a as a potential uh, Islamist uh, nuclear uh, power later on. But still, things seem to be on the mend. If you look at the uh, uh, at uh, uh, sort of a globalization, it's a catch uh, uh, as catch can. There's uh, there's no order, no global order, no regional order even. Uh, I mean, you can't you, you you couldn't describe any kind of order neither in Africa, in the Middle East, Asia even. So here we uh, and I mean. If you believe there's a decoupling between uh, a, a pacified nuclear order and uh, in an uh, ever more anarchic global order, well, then the question is, number one, what are nuclear uh, weapons for? And number two, the second part of the question, uh, that decoupling, which is not the one you referred to in your presentation, uh, but that decoupling, uh, is does it not simply reflect a total powerlessness of, uh, of nuclear powers, the, 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 uh, the impotence of uh, uh, nuclear powers. Now, this uh, idea of uh, uh, accommodating uh, India as a P6, uh, I mean, isn't that dream just that, simply because uh, nuclear powers have become powerless in the global balance? That's a good point, uh, particularly about uh, the, the decoupling and the reason why um, India sort of, you know, wants to hold on to that. But, but I would probably argue uh, in, in two ways. Um, you know, number one is that I think India today has the status not necessarily because of its nuclear weapons, uh, but because of the other things that it is doing. But the Indian argument may be that the nuclear weapons gave it that space and autonomy to do that kind of a thing. Uh, and that's why they're kind of critical. It's not necessarily, you know, again, it's like it's going to be used for deterrence in the classic sense, but not very much of a buildup, much, much slower. And that's why India is not necessarily playing in that role very much. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily see that giving up is going to give it a benefit in the global order. So that's the reason why it's like to sort of retain that as well. But there's an interesting counterfactual question there. Um, what happens if tomorrow Brazil decides to go nuclear? How would the international community react? Would the Security Council pass a resolution uh, saying you're violating the NPT, um, you know, I mean, h how would that response be? You know, I, I guess the question is, again, in, in India, uh, as you said, sui generis case, not in the NPT, uh, you know, part of the old order. But if somebody, a, a state like that, I mean, would you really be able to disengage with Brazil? Uh, so how would you kind of accommodate, you know, how would you kind of uh, en engage with them as well? Uh, Nicole, I didn't get your first question. I apologize for that. If you could just repeat that a bit. The first question was more a comment. Uh, oh, right. Yeah, yeah. The L'ordre nucléaire. The nuclear disorder doesn't seem to be that chaotic whereas global order does seem to be completely and increasingly anarchic to me. And, and, and here, actually, you know, uh, you, you struck me on a point that I should elaborate a little bit more, and I talked about this a little bit in the start. The original order, uh, nuclear order that we talked about, was a top-bottom order. The superpowers basically sort of decided and, you know, some countries sort of resisted more than others, but mostly they came along, right? Uh, but, and then you built up all of these institutions for interaction and engagement at the global level between, between the two sides, right? But today you're absolutely right. If there is going to form a new uh, nuclear order, it's going to be bottom-up. 
And you're absolutely right, because one of the other concerns is that in all of these areas where there is proliferation now, you know, you talked about the problem states, right? Pakistan, DPRK, Iran, Israel, I'd mentioned as well, are in areas where, A, there's very high tension, B, there are no regional institutions at all uh, to, for interaction between these two countries. Where do the Israelis and the Iranians interact together? As far as I know, there is only one uh, institution, uh, which is the Central European uh, interaction, uh, where the Iranians and Israelis sit on the same table. Only one. Uh, India and Pakistan, uh, on SARC, one. North Korea, where does it sit with any of its other neighbors? None. So the point you're absolutely making of that chaos uh, and disorder uh, is very much at the regional level. But I think it also has likely repercussions for the global level. Because, you know, time and time again, uh, and you've seen this particularly from the European perspective, but other perspectives, that it is conflicts in this region that has drawn the globe in to its own detriment, uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, and potentially Iran. And so one level is going to be to try and maybe address this at the regional level. Uh, that poses its own challenges, but also to try and see how the regional can be linked to the global. And that may be something to perhaps try and develop and, and evolve a little bit more as well. But yes, I mean, I think, you know, that's maybe one way that you need to address the security dimensions uh, in, this, in this particular area. Hello, Lasalle. Yes, yeah, sure. well, participé à New I was in New York, and I participated in the non-proliferation treaty uh, revision talks and for a half day international organizations and NGOs could address official delegations and say as global citizens from all the countries all over the world we would like to warn you of the danger of a nuclear war and we hope this non-proliferation uh, treaty will stress the uh, 15 or 13 points in the 1995 convention, which were quite clear. Uh, it was supposed to be about upgrading nuclear disarmament. So countries that did not have a nuclear weapon, that was the purpose of the non-proliferation treaty, and this had to do with Ségolène Royal, Dominique Trosgan, and Fabius, and they said you can access technology but not military armament, and that's what the treaty says. Nuclear arms won't be used or won't be developed by those that don't have the nuclear weapon. But those who do have a nuclear weapon must commit sincerely to disarmament. And since 1995, unfortunately, uh, we were reminded of this here in France just last week, we're far from this goal. We've been upgrading our missiles, and France is not the only power doing this. So we're in the face of a moral responsibility. And at the same time, there is a schedule we have to face up to. And our toolkit is depleted. The only thing we have now left is reinforcing the Security Council. The Chapter 7 says we could have an international police force if there's a crisis. But we would have to build that uh, police force, that international police force. And remember what happened with the International Criminal Court. Uh, the states did not display a sincere uh, willingness to do things. The NGO's pressure led to negotiations, and in 2002, Kofi Annan at uh, the UN welcomed NGOs and said, you are a crucial stakeholder in these negotiations. They cannot be left in the hands of diplomats, because otherwise our planet will not become sustainable and we will not be able to avoid a nuclear disaster. So our toolkit is building up the United Nations, the United Nations Charter, but towards a genuine nuclear disarmament, as was the case, and it wasn't easy, for chemical and, bio and bacteriological weapons. At first, no one believed in it, but we're heading there. We're getting there. The speaker has to use the microphone for the interpreting. Could the people please use a microphone for the interpreting? <laughs> 
I'd like to ask a question about terrorist groups. Nicole rightly said that for a long time we mentioned the terrorist nuclear threat. So far it hasn't surfaced and fortunately for us, but I believe you mentioned it in your lecture. Do you think that they could still have a role to play, especially in the areas that are under tension now? And then it would have a real impact on the balance that seems to be emerging today? Thank you. A couple more questions, and then I will give you the floor back. The interpreter cannot hear the person speaking. The, no. Uh, uh, let me start with the, uh, the, the, the last two terrorist uh, sort of questions related to terrorism. So I think, um, you know, I've written in, in other places, I think uh, nuclear terrorism is, um, there's a high uh, probability but low possibility. So there's, uh, you know, because it's so catastrophic, if it happens, it's going to be, uh, you know, very dramatic. But there do doesn't seem to be as much of a, uh, a necessary driver at the moment. And, you know, there are sort of four or five conditions that need to be fulfilled before a, a state or, or one of these groups goes down uh, the nuclear path. Uh, and it actually has to do with very mundane things like their ideology, uh, but also their their monetary capabilities, but also their technical capabilities, because um, nuclear weapons, uh, you know, beyond the point, are not very easy to uh, transport. And then, you know, invariably you need to build them in situ, where to use. I mean, unless you steal, uh, you know, an operational nuclear weapon, which hopefully, you know, we are now uh, getting to a stage with one or two exceptions that that is not likely to be the case. Uh, is, is, is not that much of a concern. But I think there's more of a concern that you um, may actually have uh, action by terrorist groups uh, which leads on to the kind of uh, tension which rises between, say, India and Pakistan, but there could be others uh, leading, leading up as, as, as there as well. And that's a real uh, sort of concern. But this comes then to the point that you were raising about, uh, well, isn't it better in a way that it prevented a conflict? I have a slightly contrarian view on this, right? Wars are certainly bad because, you know, I mean, people die, they, they cost. I mean, there, there's all, all sorts of good reasons not to encourage war. Um, but, uh, and, you know, this is where the Indian subcontinent has been very interesting. Uh, wars have actually led, indeed, why, in the Indian subcontinent is not unique in this case, it's also led to a degree of normalization between uh, different countries. It has sort of sorted out uh, some of the inherent contradictions uh, which were historically there either because of colonial uh, foibles or others. I mean, let's take an example of uh, Bangladesh. Uh, 
right? Uh, the emergence of Bangladesh was unfortunately through a very violent process. But the fact that you know, Bangladesh is there today, I think, has led to a greater degree of stability within the uh, subcontinent than before Bangladesh's existence. Now, I'm not for a minute advocating war between India and Pakistan, but let's say Mumbai had happened in the absence. Uh, I mean, I, I would actually flip the question around. I would actually say Mumbai would not have happened if Pakistan did not have nuclear weapons. Because, because Pakistan had nuclear weapons, it knew that it could go ahead and do Mumbai and not expect a retaliation. Because if there was an attack without nuclear weapons, India would have retaliated. And out of that retaliation, maybe there would have been some kind of an arrangement that came into play. And this is, we're talking about the subcontinent, and you know, that's fine. But you can visualize the same thinking going on in Iran and Israel. Uh, and you know, so the nuclear umbrella actually does give states the potential to carry out these kind of attacks, knowing that there is no chance of a retaliation. Uh, and this is part of the, part of the sort of challenge and, 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 and sort of problem. I, I want to come to the, uh, the excellent question about, you know, again, the missed opportunity in 1995 with the 13 steps of the NPT. But I think there that remains a fundamental challenge. I think while everybody sees disarmament as an ideal, one that is to be achieved, the concern is that unless you have other mechanisms to prevent great power conflict, the prospects of conflict may actually rise, particularly among the great powers. You will have other conflicts, which is unfortunate. You're still having those conflicts, uh, but they're not involving great powers. So the challenge is how do you do disarmament while ensuring a degree of security particularly among the major powers. That still remains the challenge with us, unfortunately. Any other questions from the audience? I would just like to build on what Nicole was saying earlier, and I think we'll be discussing this uh, further. I think the issue of an underlying nuclear balance, obviously it doesn't exist, but what is the future nuclear balance in Asia? Can we strike a balance? Uh, will nuclear power lead to a new balance? Or is the idea assuaging nuclear disorder, but we won't strike a balance? Or do you think we are heading towards a balance? You have the floor. Thank you. Do the United Nations only rely on the established nuclear order? Back to Nicole. Among the reasons for the nuclear disorder, you did not mention technological innovation at all. Is that because you don't think technological innovation presents any risk at all? That's the question I wanted to ask you. Do you think uh, technological innovation by major powers can be causing nuclear disorder, especially for intermediary powers? Uh, excellent questions, all of them, and, and that one in particular. The short answer is yes, of course. Uh, and that is partly to blame. And I think you saw a trend towards this vis-a-vis -vis missile defense. And missile defense was a little bit about ideology, but a lot about technology. 
the fact that you could have that capability now when you could not have it even 10 years before made all the difference. And suddenly, and mind you, every country which is complaining about missile defense has a missile defense program. <laughs> but, the, but the problem is that there's differences. You know that some missile defense programs are really working or could work, and others are not. Uh, so the question is, uh, you know, how do you actually create, a, uh, maintain the parity? Because you're changing that relationship. But that's one element. The cyber is another one, uh, which is starting to very change quite dynamically. Uh, you know, U.S. Um, strategic commanders have really been on record. Uh, I'm trying to remember whether it was General Chilton uh, was on record saying, my number one concern today is not a nuclear attack anymore. No more. It's a cyber attack. And, and get this, you know, in a nuclear, a nuclear era, we used to talk about uh, the launch, uh, you know, the war would last 15 minutes, half an hour if you were really lucky. Uh, in a cyber attack, it will be over in seconds. Uh, all your systems will be down. Uh, and, you know, and, and they've done it occasionally, sort of life-threatening systems, maybe not seconds, but, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's got tremendous potential there. So that's one area. And the other area that we've talked about, which could also lead to a certain degree of nuclear disorder, is, is not the militarization of space, which has happened, is the weaponization of space. Uh, and you're starting to see a trend in that direction as well. China, uh, others, you know, starting to have that potential and starting to build up on that, which is starting to change the way that nuclear relations sort of build as well. So I think that's a, that's a very, very good point. I mentioned it in passing, but you're right. You know, it's one that needs to be built up a little bit more. Um, I just wanted a clarification on that question about does the UN rely only on nuclear weapon states uh, in the sense of maintaining world order or... Oh, maintaining the UN or maintaining world order? Maintaining the world order. Uh, uh, I would probably say it's the other way around. I would probably say that the nuclear weapon states depend on the UN to resolve their differences, but also uh, look at other parts of the world where they don't want to be involved. Uh, and you see a lot of the UN peacekeeping is a really a tacit agreement between the nuclear weapon, you know, between the P5, that look, this is an area which is not of strategic concern to us, so let the UN go in there. Uh, when it is of strategic concern, France is there in Mali, uh, or in Kotowa, or in other places, right? So, and that, and, but also, it's an understanding done through the UN, where, you know, say I'm taking on France, but there are other countries as well, basically saying, look, we're going into Kotowa, but don't worry. I mean, we're not taking over. This is not recolonization. It's not an issue, right? So that's where those relations are kind of resolved a little bit as well. So I would probably say that it's the other way around. Uh, the UN probably, there was a very minor opportunity where, you know, and, and I think Bruno would probably know this more, and, you know, we've, we've talked about this a lot as well. In the early part of the nuclear age, there was a possibility under the Baruch plan that nuclear weapons, uh, not on any kind of alert, may actually have come under the UN. Long stretch, long way, uh, but that would have been a very different UN. Uh, it would have been a very different sort of uh, structure, uh, et cetera, et cetera, sort of going, going forward. Um, I'm tempted to answer your question, uh, but it's also a wonderful preemption of my lecture. No, 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 but, no, but, 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 but I, want to, I, 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 I want to address that because I think there are two elements. Uh, one I mentioned, and I'll highlight that as well. The biggest challenge to the nuclear order today is coming from Asia, right? And the challenge is coming in two ways. One is a bottom-up challenge in regions which are very unstable, there's no institutions, none whatsoever, where these countries are talking to each other and trying to work out what the relationship is. But there's also a top-down approach, which is problematic. And that is, China is not looking at India or Pakistan, no, definitely not Pakistan, or even, even Russia as a contender. It's looking at the United States. And as China builds up, 
to counter the United States, India looks at China with even more concern and sort of says, listen, this uh, capacity is overwhelming. So the, India is now starting to respond to China, which is responding to the U.S. Uh, so in a way, there's a different kind of a triangular relationship that is going to create problems uh, within, within Asia as well. Until now, uh, you know, both China, certainly China, but also India have kept to a very limited uh, nuclear buildup even though there's a tremendous degree of modernization, but with growing economic capacity and capability, uh, particularly in China, but also in India, I think that may change. Uh, and then the numbers game may become very, very different uh, as, as well. Okay, we will develop this next time at your lecture. Maybe everyone here in the audience won't uh, be able to come. So, Guillaume, Henri... Are there any other questions from the audience? Then maybe Bruno? I have a very bad question to ask. When you mentioned deterrence in Europe, the question of values is raised. And I was impressed by the lack of the mention of values in your lecture. Can we have a an order with diverging or different values? What role do values play in our future world order? Good evening. I'd just like to comment on order and disorder. I think today's disorder has to do with the fact that institutions like the United Nations or treaties like NATO can't address new threats. And these new threats are short-circuiting the nuclear order, which is centerpiece now. And this will move to the global commons, meaning spaces which are on the outskirts of the rule of law and sovereignty. So how do we address these threats? I'm thinking of marine... Uh, bottoms of space, of cyber, how can we address them and what are our legal tools to do so? And I think bypassing nuclear issues will naturally come up because of these common spaces. Nicole is leaving, but I just wanted to say a few words. We'll discuss it another time. But I did have a quick answer to your question, and if I could sum it up, it's uh, the fact that nuclear powers are impotent doesn't have to do with the nuclear weapon for me. The nuclear weapon has another edge, but we'll get back to it some other time. Pal, you have the floor to answer and conclude your lecture. Thank you again very much. And, and let me... Um, start with the question of values. Um, I think there are some values which are universal. Uh, there are some values that every country in the world has signed up to. Uh, you know, this is the Human Rights Declaration, which is part of the UN Charter, whether you, you know, you talk about Asian values, etc. you know, you have signed up to them. The implementation of those values in reality is the challenge. You know, how they're, how they're imposed, uh, et cetera, et cetera, is, is, is the case. Um, I suppose the other value which has is, which is caught up, right, is the notion of a no-war uh, order that you really don't want, uh, you, you know, sort of, war, particularly between major powers. And a no-war institution, uh, you know, has been established in, through, through two different divergent tracts. One, and this has been the European example, it actually came out of the very bitter and unfortunate experience of not one, but two world wars. Uh, the number of Europeans who died, and out of that experience of saying, you know, we cannot do this again, uh, was a very important lesson which came forward. But I, there's more to it than that. And this is where the second track comes in. Today, 
War is unthinkable in Europe. Why is that? You know, some will say it's because of the presence of nuclear weapons. And to some extent, perhaps they've played a role. But more important are the institutions. Uh, Europeans are now interacting more with each other, and I'm not even thinking about the European Union as a, you know, kind of unifying, uh, you know, supranational you know, entity. Uh, the level of integration is phenomenal, and that's obviously based on some common values, but even to, and I would argue that even if nuclear weapons disappeared from Europe today, there would be no chance of Europeans going to war again. Even on the question that you said about even without nuclear weapons, there, you know, Europe is a continent at peace with itself. There are challenges from outside, that's a different issue. You could also argue, if you go down that route, I agree with you, but you could have said that if the European process happened between the uh, mid-40s and the late-80s, that's also because nuclear weapons existed, because it happened in the shadow of extended deterrence and a peace provided by nuclear weapons. So right. you, you cannot... Uh, I, I agree. I, I, you, cannot, you have, to go, I, you no, have to go beyond. I absolutely agree, but, 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 but let me put a flip side to that. I totally agree. But the point is Europe built the institutions. There are regions which have had nuclear weapons for much longer and don't have those institutions. That's the point I'm making. So you're absolutely right. You may, may have given the space, and so that, that, that's an important sort of element. But, you know, when you look at other parts of the world, there are two, uh, you know, it's really problematic in some ways. On the one hand, you may say it's fortunate. Uh, they have not experienced a similar level of conflict. Uh, but because they haven't experienced a similar level of conflict, uh, nuclear weapons in many instances is just seen as another weapon to use. And that's very dangerous. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there is no integration. There has been no buildup of a no-war community. Uh, war is still possible. And that's problematic, uh, you know, sort of too as well. Now, this is, none of this is to say that one, uh, that there are different value systems operating. Uh, it's, I think, there is the common values because you've signed up to a universal declaration, etc. But the operationalization of those values uh, has taken on very different tracks and very different sort of uh, trends. So, so that would be my, my argument uh, on, on, on that particular uh, notion. Um, the question on um, order and disorder uh, and, and the sense of you know, whether uh, the institutions are able to address uh, the new sort of threats which are, which are going forward. Um, I would put the threats, and I'd call them transnational threats, into two categories. One which is coming from non-state actors, uh, and here I would include, you know, terrorism acts, piracy acts. Uh, there, actually, you have seen much greater coordination and possible cooperation uh, to work together, uh, e even in natural disasters, for example. You know, there's, there's more uh, coordination and cooperation. But in the other areas, uh, there is not. But I'll tell you why that is not the case. Uh, and and let, me, let me identify actually five or six areas. You know, you, talk, you spoke about space. You spoke about cyber. But I would also include climate. Uh, I would also include, uh, you know, maybe even energy in that, right? And here, what is the, here is where we, we come into a very interesting sort of dimension, and I've uh, written on this more, more recently. In all of these four domains that we've talked about, there is no international regime. The regimes are in formation, number one. But number two, it's also not quite clear which countries dominate these regimes or do dominate this area. Uh, many of the emerging powers also have an important role in some of these areas. So what you're starting to see is a new form of negotiations uh, which are starting to develop these regimes, particularly for this area. But this is not going to be the nuclear five. It may include the nuclear five, but it may also include other, other countries. And that, actually coming back to trying to conclude the uh, lecture and presentation, is maybe another way that a new order may form. 
where you're working and working with a different set of countries, many of whom don't have nuclear weapons, but may have capabilities in space, in cyber, uh, and are also major powers. Uh, and bringing them around the table may be one way of trying to formulate a world order which eventually may lead to lessening of a dependence on nuclear weapons. It's one possibility. And maybe on that optimistic note, I'll, I'll end. Merci, Paul. Thank you very much, Paul. Paul Sadu will be back on March 3rd to discuss strategic issues in Asia. And I'd like to tell you that next time Beatrice Hauser will be back to conclude their mini cycle of conferences on deterrence. And we will be having the lecture in the military school at the Metro Ecole Militaire. Try to be ahead of time because you need to pass security to get inside the premises. So please come a little early at the military school. Thank you. Thank you, pal. Thank you.